okay, I was in Copenhagen giving some talks, and I had to go five miles south of town in order to find the venue. I used the metro. It's clean, it's efficient, it runs every five or seven minutes, and then I figured out why it's so good. There's no crew on board. It doesn't cost them a lot of money to run more trains. There's no driver, no engineer. There's no guy looking whether the doors are shut or not. And I thought, yes, this is great. They can add as many trains as they want. And then I thought, but on the other hand, they've taken the humans out of this operation. I'm Seth Shostag. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. The artificial intelligence in your computerized voice assistant is still basic. It will lock your doors on command, but it won't refuse you entry. And when self-driving cars are tested, a human usually still monitors from the passenger seat. And biotechnology has not rewritten the human genome. But after all of these statements is the caveat, yet. But like an adult holding the hands of a toddler taking her first steps, we are teaching our technology to eventually go it alone. Are we sure that it will carry us and our best interests along for the ride? In this episode, why some technology might have an anti-human bias and the argument for keeping humans in the loop. Astrophysicist Martin Rees likes to take on the big questions. For example, he thinks we might live in a multiverse. That is, we might be living in a universe that's only one of a possibly infinite number of universes. He's not saying that we have good evidence for this, mind you, but that it's possible given the limitations of what we know about reality. We do know that the renowned cosmologist has multi-titles. A former president of the Royal Society, a professor of cosmology and astrophysics at the University of Cambridge, a fellow at Trinity College, Martin Rees is Astronomer Royal. And after receiving knighthood for his service to science, he was also given the title Baron Rees of Ludlow. The popular writings of Professor or Lord or Baron Rees have helped the public better understand major cosmological phenomena such as black holes, but he's also given to speculation about some things for which we don't yet have hard evidence, such as the aforementioned multiverse. And in a new book, he turns his speculative powers to dramatic events even closer to home. Calling himself an armchair theorist, yet another title, he considers how powerful transformative technologies are now bringing us to a critical point I describe myself in my book as a technical optimist, but a political pessimist. And what is depressing is the gap between the way the world could be today and the way it actually is. And we must just hope that that gap narrows and doesn't widen as time goes on. On the Future, Prospects for Humanity is Professor Reese's book. There are some things about the future we do know, he says. The earth will be more crowded and the demand for resources more acute the population is growing, and this is one of the few things we can predict a few decades ahead with confidence. By mid-century, it'll be at least 9 billion by most estimates. But more important than that, we hope that the people now in uh, Africa and uh, India, etc., will be able to increase their consumption, even if we reduce ours. And the challenge will be whether we can provide a decent, sustainable life for 9 billion people. So what are the prospects, not just for humanity's survival, which, as any astronomer will tell you, has at least one end point when the sun becomes a red giant five billion years from now and bakes the Earth, but until then, how do we survive and thrive when many technological developments could ultimately deny us achieving both? From nuclear weapons to biotechnology to artificial intelligence, humans are developing powerful tools that could enhance our quality of life or slip from our control to pose existential risks. Martin, you take on bioengineering, and one of the points you made in your book really brought me up short. To develop nuclear weapons requires complex and expensive machinery, but biohacking, I mean, that can be done on the kitchen table. Not everyone can build a bomb, but anyone could build a virus, I guess. So how serious is that threat? Well, I think it is very serious. They may not be able to do it on a kitchen table, but in a university or industrial laboratory, these things can be done. And here again, there's scope for 
error and terror, um, and the technology is advancing very fast. And just as we are concerned about the uh, risk of cyber attacks that can be done by individual small groups, I think we will have to worry about the same things being done in bio by engineering viruses to make them more virulent and transmissible. This can be done. And also by some sort of genetic modification, what's called gene drive, where you try to make a species extinct going out of control. Gene drive is a technique that can be used to make, for instance, a mosquito extinct, and it's been used in a benign way to try and wipe out the mosquito that carries a Zika virus. But of course, if you tinker with an ecological system, there's a risk of unintended consequences, just like the effect of importing alien species into Australia, for instance. And so I think there's a risk of the misuse of these technologies. Then there's perhaps the greatest boogeyman out there, artificial intelligence. Maybe you can tell us about that computer that learned how to play the game of Go better than any human without taking a single lesson or reading a book. Well, of course, computers have the big advantage over us of thinking much faster. They can play 100,000 games in a day. And this computer, which was uh, programmed by a company in London called DeepMind, they gave this the rules of Go, and it played against itself 100,000 of times and then could beat a world champion, and ditto for chess. And this may not seem a big deal because we know that Kasparov was beaten by an IBM computer more than 20 years ago, but... In that case, the IBM computer was programmed by expert chess players. In this case, it was just given the rules. And so this just illustrates how machines can uh, learn just given the data through exploiting the advantage of speed. And uh, this means that they can handle huge bodies of data in benign ways, but there's a risk of runaway. Actually, I'm not someone who frets too much about AI at the moment, not in the short term, because uh, they can't deal with the external world as well as we can. They can only deal with it if we have the Internet of Things, which, of course, allows them to actually control and mess up the external world. But I don't worry too much about AI. I worry about bio and cyber in the short run to a greater extent. Well, uh, but this machine that learned how to play Go... Uh, better than any human, essentially in a few days, you know, just give it the rules. It was like teaching a kid the moves uh, for Go, which are actually pretty simple, and within two days it can beat anybody on the planet. That sounds like a threat to both tradition, after all, there have been thousands of years of literature, if you will, on how to play Go, and a threat to expertise, all wiped out by the mighty mega flop. but this doesn't worry you. Well, indeed, that's true, and I think in any enterprise where you have large amounts of data, computers are going to do far better. I mean, managing uh, electricity grids, managing uh, road traffic networks and things like that, they clearly be far better, and that's a good thing. And, of course, uh, we know that they learn to recognize faces by looking at billions of examples, dogs and cats and all that, and uh, the best ways they learn to translate are just by uh, being given millions of pages to read. And uh, I say in my book that they have an infinite boredom threshold. They can read millions of pages of European Union documents in many languages, and that's the way they learn language. And this is the advantage of speed, and they just learn by themselves. And this is going to be tremendously valuable. But there are many things which involve common sense, which people are realising it's harder to programme into them. Uh, I was told one story that one of these computers, I think it was the one that beat the champion in the game of Jeopardy, it was asked, which is bigger, a shoebox or Mount Everest, and couldn't answer. So, I mean, we have to worry a lot about sort of uh, real stupidity as well as artificial intelligence, and I think that'll be true for a long time. Well, 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 let me just follow up a little bit because, uh, you know, I'm not sure that reading all the European Union documents is going to make any computer <laughs> particularly literate, but consider the AI of a century hence. Will it be able to do things like writing the great English novel, something creative, better than any human? Well, I mean, that's not impossible because uh, already machines can produce uh, music in the style of Bach or such like, which experts find hard to discriminate from the real thing. So there are many things that they will be able to do. There's no doubt about that. But I think uh, people worry, of course, about what this does for the labor market. And it's not just truck drivers and people like that who are going to be out of a job. Indeed, jobs like plumbing and gardening would be very hard to automate, but certain kinds of jobs will be automated. And I think we're going to have to have a more socialist economy whereby the 
money, as it were, earned by the robots and their owners is heavily taxed and used to subsidise huge numbers of jobs for, for instance, carers for old people where you, most of us want a real person to look after us, not a machine. And at the moment, there are far too few such people, and they're very underappreciated and underpaid. So I think what we need to do is to uh, ensure that there are enough posts which are secure and well-paid to do the kind of things where we want a human being, looking after the old, teaching assistants in schools and things like that. So it sounds like the future of humanity is to have jobs to look after humanity. Well, in, indeed, because we want a human to do that, because the post-human era uh, is still quite a long way away. Let me ask you, uh, if we really do invent our successors in terms now of machine intelligence, then it seems to me the book you should be writing is not about prospects for humanity, but prospects for the machines, right? Well, in the long run, yes, but I think the point is that this century is a crucial one in the history of our planet because uh, the Earth's been around for 45 million centuries and this is the first when one species, namely ours, can trigger this transition towards possibly electronic post-humans who will have a far future. And, of course, the other thing we know as astronomers is that the future is even longer than the past. The sun's been going four and a half billion years It'll be six billion years more before it dies and the expanding universe may go on forever. And so we should not think of ourselves as humans as being the culmination of evolution. We're not even a halfway stage. We're the end of Darwinian selection. Future evolution will be a sort of secular intelligent design and could be even faster. But that's the transition. But we are in this century responsible for whether that transition occurs or whether we leave a depleted a world for our successors and foreclose all these great potentialities. Well, finally, Martin, your book is a Catholic, that's with a small c, treatment of the many aspects of science and technology that bear on our future. You, you write concisely and with wit, but not with untethered emotion. So I am prompted to ask, are you an optimist in all this? I mean, technology can clearly create problems, but do you figure that for every problem it creates, there will be a solution? I think there can be a solution, but will it be implemented? That's the question. And the stakes are getting higher because it's easier than it was before for a small group or even an individual to cause damage that cascades globally. Put it another way, the global village will have its village idiots and they will have a global range. And so that means we're going to have a bumpy ride through this century, I think, because it'll be hard to avoid some uh, misuse by error, if not by design, of these powerful technologies. And, of course, we have to worry that any such event will cascade globally, simply because we're so interconnected. Financial system, supply chains, travel, and uh, everything else means that it would not be possible for something to go badly wrong in one uh, region of the world without it being a setback globally. And so that's what makes me pessimistic. So I'm a technical optimist, but I worry about the downsides of technology, especially as uh, the evidence is that our political systems are really not very capable of coping with these issues which need to be handled transnationally. So I think the challenge of governance is going to be something which may be more than we can cope with, and that'll be the bad news. But the technology can be used to huge human benefit. Martin Rees... Thanks so very much for speaking with us. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's great to be in touch again, Seth. Martin Rees is a former president of the Royal Society, a professor of cosmology and astrophysics at the University of Cambridge, and the author of On the Future, Prospects for Humanity. Well, of course, this is not the first time that technology has seemed to threaten the apocalypse. I mean, when the steam engine was introduced, right, people were out of jobs. They were worried about the pastoral landscapes going away as these ugly belching steam locomotives <laughs> plowed through the landscape. Uh, but it didn't work out that bad, actually, in the end. But I like the fact that Martin Rees points out that this century may really be fundamentally different, that this century may be crucial for our potential into the future, maybe a post-human potential, because the technologies we're developing today don't just change our lives, they may supplant our lives.
What is your singular defining characteristic? Juggling motherhood and competitive archery? A part-time gig operating a blimp? Your colorful murals of root vegetables? All of that is obviously quite impressive, but what the machines want to know is your unique, algorithmically derived consumer profile. And frankly, they probably already have it. Facebook uses our past data to try to predict what it is that we're about to do. And what Facebook has found out is that they usually know a little bit before we do, with 80% accuracy, what's going to happen. Media theorist Douglas Rushkoff, next. We're doing our part, keeping humans in the loop on Big Picture Science. Okay, I'm not going to go easy on you, so hang on to your ears because I'm here to ask you to help pay the bills we incur for producing this show. Now, those costs cover such things as studio charges for the guests we interview, telecommunications bills, the expense of carriage by NPR distributors, podcast hosting. Well, that's just to name a couple. But even so, the budget for producing this show is really small. It's one ten thousandth as much as Americans spend on birdseed. We're very economical. It all means that your contribution really, really makes a difference. It's not just another donation. It's important. So go to bigpicturescience.org now and make that difference. The donation interface, well, it's obvious. Thanks. Douglas Rushkoff is not embarrassed to admit that he likes humans. In a world that celebrates automating as much as possible and minimizing human influence, some would say this might be a radical position. Machines are tidy, humans are messy, but for all our imprecision and unpredictability, in fact, because of it, he likes us, he really likes us, and he'd like us to stick around. Now, we've been talking in this episode of Big Picture Science about whether inventions of the future will keep humans in the loop. Dr. Rushkoff points out that we bipedals have already become bystanders to many of our own creations. From autocorrect on our phones to autonomous cars turning us into passive passengers to algorithms that trade our data for profit. A professor of media theory and digital economy at Queens College at the City University of New York, he says that electronically enforced exactitude is increasingly doing away with what makes us human. Instead of unleashing the wild possibilities of the human imagination, he writes, we end up using technology to make people behave more consistently with their algorithmically derived consumer profile. The culprits? Well, in part, it's the anti-human philosophy that suffuses both Wall Street and Silicon Valley. Dr. Rushkoff has written extensively about human autonomy in the digital age in books such as Present Shock and Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity. He has computers on his mind by profession, but what he really craves in his latest book, Team Human, is more eye contact. He thinks we all do. Well, he drew many sets of eyes to him when he was recently invited to come to a private resort for what he thought was to give a talk to wealthy investment bankers. Now, since the compensation for that talk was as much as he'd make in six months as a professor, he said yes. But upon arriving, he learned their real agenda, a face-to-face -face conversation with a man whose job it is to consider where technology is taking us. And I got to the green room of this luxury resort out west. And then instead of bringing me out on stage, they brought these five men into the green room with me. And they sat around this little round table. And it turned out that instead of me doing a talk, I was going to be really peppered for an hour by these guys with very simple binary questions like Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, augmented reality or virtual reality, as if they're you know, placing their bets on future technologies. And uh, once they kind of warmed up to me, they got around to the real question, which was um, New Zealand or Alaska? New Zealand or Alaska? What were these rich tech guys looking for? The cleanest air, lowest population density, a chance to examine fuzzy ungulates up close? 
you know, they wanted to know where they should put their doomsday bunkers, you know, for the inevitable event, the electromagnetic pulse or social unrest or AI calamity that, that was going to just end the world as we knew it. So they were just really trying to earn enough money to be able to insulate themselves from the reality that they themselves were creating rather than thinking they could spend their time and energy making the world a place they didn't need to escape from. Technology at the service of raw capitalism is used to categorize people and extract their data to monetize, says Dr. Rushkoff. Those who wield it are putting no real investment in the health of our collective future. But these technology titans are investing in their own future. For example, where to go when things get rough to luxury underground digs in New Zealand or Alaska. Well, they had been looking at a, a lot of climate data, and I guess they had paid for a lot of analysis. Uh, New Zealand they liked because it was far away from the social unrest, and Alaska they liked because as all the glaciers melt, Alaska's going to become, they think, like Vancouver, you know, so they're buying land outside Anchorage. You know, I did not have advice for them as far as how to retreat, but my advice to them was more, what could they do to make the world a place that they didn't feel the need to hedge their bets? You know, why were they going to spend, and they saw it as an 80-20 thing, that they were going to spend 20% of their assets on the possibility of disaster, and 80% on just, you know, investing and trying to make money. And so I told them, you know, that the thing that they spent the most time on was, you know, a very human angle, actually. They wanted to know how can they maintain control of their security force after the event? Because they knew that if their money wasn't going to be worth anything, then what would stop the guys with guns who have been charged with protecting the bunker from the masses? What would stop them from just taking charge of the thing? And these guys were thinking about really bizarre, you know, black mirror sorts of solutions, you know, embedding them with chips or putting shock collars around them or only having a couple of people know the combination to the food supply. So to be clear, these bunkers would be for them and their families. They're not planning on building bunkers for all of us and bringing us to safety underground. No, and that's because they have really fallen prey to this, you know, highly individualistic culture that we live in. They're thinking exactly that this is for me. I mean, why earn all those billions of dollars if not to have a competitive advantage against all the other humans out there? Well, they certainly see themselves as a discrete unit from the rest of us, I should say. And you write that the future was something we were supposed to build and plan together, all of us. <laughs> but now, as you say, the architects of our future have a contingency plan to opt out of that future. So where did we go wrong as we journeyed down this, this highway of our bright technological future? Well, it's interesting. You know, those of us who were around for the early Internet era, we really did see this as kind of wiring up the global brain, you know, that we were going to unleash the vast potentials of, of connected human consciousness and see where that took us. And I think what we didn't realize was that digital technology has an equal and opposite effect, you know, that just as it can connect people together, it also is very discreet. You know, everything in the, the digital landscape is a one or a zero, yes or no. And I, I know we have things like fuzzy logic and all, but they still just reduce something in between one and zero to a one or a zero. So we end up uh, much more atomized and isolated and polarized, particularly when we use digital technology just to put people into different statistical buckets so that we can ply them with new algorithms designed to extract their data or get them to act in one way or another way. And that's just something I think that we need to become conscious of, the way that these technologies can kind of turn against our better intentions and then use them instead very consciously to retrieve human values rather than to thwart them. In other words, there's all of these great young developers who come in wanting to disrupt this or disrupt that, and they think that they're kind of remaking the world from the bottom up. But what they don't realize is that their companies are so invested with the values of venture capital, of 
how are we going to get a hundred times return on this little app that you just made? And if you're going to deliver a hundred times investing return to a set of investors, you're going to have to pivot away from whatever pro-social design you had and towards a much more extractive one. What's being extracted from the humans that are participating in this technology is our data. So the data are being extracted. That's really all that the companies care about. That's all that these computer machine analogs care about. And we're left, as I think one journalist described it, as the discarded husks of the elephant after the ivory has been extracted from the beast. Yeah, in a sense, that's very true. We are no longer really the users of our technology. You know, we are doing technology to people. When we interact with our smartphones, our smartphones get smarter about us and we get dumber about them. You know, instead, as many have pointed out now, you know, we're being subjected to the same algorithms that are being used in Las Vegas slot machines in order to addict us. And they're training algorithms to find the human exploits and leverage them to get us to act against our own better natures. Whenever we're actually interacting with another person, whenever we're forming rapport, and especially in the real world with someone else, we're no longer serving up data to the algorithms and the companies behind them. And that's why human contact, genuine human social contact, is so dangerous. But as I look around, as I try to walk around in a city or help people with issues of economic equality, I understand that they are up against an increasingly difficult system, that technologies from Facebook to Uber to Airbnb to, uh, you know, Bitcoin have not really helped that many real people and are serving currently more to isolate, alienate, and atomize us from one another than they are helping us build rapport with one another. Can you give an example in, in what ways the algorithms get us to work against our own best interests? Um, say Facebook. So Facebook uses our past data to try to predict what it is that we're about to do. And what Facebook has found out is that they can predict with about 80% accuracy whether we're going to go on a diet in the next month or get divorced or need fertility treatments or whatever it is. They usually know a little bit before we do with 80% accuracy what's going to happen. So once they know that, they start filling our news feed with if it's a diet that we might go on with all sorts of news stories about, hey, look at this fat person who died from something, or hey, are you feeling a little overweight, or are you worried about your health, or look at the fat deposits on a person's heart who doesn't go on a diet. Now, they're not just trying to sell you the specific diet of their clients. What they're trying to do is to get their accuracy up from 80% to 90%. They want to get that pesky 20% of people who are not behaving true to their statistical profiles to actually become more like themselves, more like the way the algorithms see us. And the danger in that is we start ironing out the 20% of anomalous behavior where real innovation comes from, where human variety happens. The last thing I would like technology to do is to make people more predictable. But that's exactly what the investors want. They're looking at the future as something that's fixed. They're looking at the future as something to bet on. That's really what investors do. That's what capitalism is for. And that one of the beauties of, of being human is everything that is human. Okay, that's a tautology, <laughs> I guess. But, but the idea that we're being guided by this massive technological river into manipulated to behaviors that are ironing out some of those creative impulses and some of the, the things that you say are what are so great about being human. Right. And then, you know, once we are only understood in terms of our utility value, then our singularity folks are correct. At that point, 
Maybe computers really are better than people. Machines will always have more utility value than people. So unless people become valued for their weirdness, for their ability to hold on to ambiguity and paradox, our ability to be in these sort of liminal states between yes and no, unresolved places, unless we have any sense of essential value, that either we have souls or a purpose or some pre-existing value, then they're right. And we should just pass the evolutionary torch to our technological successors and admit that human beings need to accept our own inevitable extinction. And that's just not a place I'm willing to go. And when I'm on a panel with one of these folks, I was on with one of the famous transhumanists arguing for a place for humans in the digital future. And he said, oh, Rushkoff, you're just saying that because you're a human. Like it was some sort of hubris to want there to be a place for me and my kind. And I said, okay, fine. You know, guilty is charged. I'm on team human. I'm starting with humanity as something to preserve as an assumption of my work. And I don't, <laughs> I don't feel too bad about that. Okay, so you're suggesting a, a philosophical shift on the, on the architects of our future technology. Can you give an example of a specific kind of technology that you said uh, exemplifies kind of humane technology? Well, I mean, almost any technology can be a humane technology. I mean, and the examples, we know the classic examples of the great ones from archive.org to Wikipedia to the Firefox browser and Mozilla. There are plenty of technologies we can use in positive ways. You could use Skype in a positive way. It's just a matter of understanding what is it. You know, so Skype will not allow you to create rapport genuine rapport with another person. You can't see if their pupils are getting bigger or smaller. You can't see the micro motions of their head. So you can hear in their words, yes, I agree with you, but your mirror neurons won't fire, the oxytocin won't go through your blood, and you won't establish genuine rapport. So you have to understand, what am I going to get from Skype? I'll get something, but I won't get that sense of solidarity that I got in real life. And once you know that, then you're in a good place. Then you know, okay, I could blame the technology for this. Right now, people don't. Right now, people blame the other person. They feel that, well, is that person not really on my side? Are they not really honest with me? Because we haven't evolved to understand that these filters are what are preventing that sense of, of rapport from being established, not some failing in the other person. Well, Douglas Rushkoff, thanks so much for speaking to us. Uh, thanks for having me. Douglas Rushkoff is a media theorist at Queens College at the City University of New York. He is the author of Present Shock, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity, and most recently, Team Human. You know, what's interesting to me about this is the fact that we might be trying to homogenize humans, you know, turn us all into products because that makes it easier for, for the various media on the web, for example, to sell us stuff. If we're all, you know, very predictable, we fall into boxes that they can, they can categorize, then they know what to send our way. That's why I like the idea that we should be valued for our weirdness. Yes, well, that's right. When it, that at least gives somebody some reason to value me, I've got to tell you. One society that finds balance between advanced surveillance and retaining human control exists, at least in science fiction. The level of surveillance that I describe in it is also not that far advanced from the level of surveillance that's going on now. It's the way that information is managed that's different. The author of The Sentinel Cycle next. She's keeping humans in the loop on Big Picture Science. been talking in this episode of Big Picture Science about whether our rapidly changing technology is posing a serious challenge to our humanity. 
I really want to continue questioning that premise that technology and humanity are diametric opposites. Author Malka Older does just that in a series of books that imagine a future where people have not been lost to the machine, although machines, in the form of computer technology and surveillance devices, are everywhere. In her books, political alliances have been redrawn to create more representative and fluid groups called sentinels. But the ubiquitous information technology is not antagonistic to democracy, although that doesn't mean the future is utopian. Malka Older's books, Infomocracy, Null States, and the recent State Tectonics, make up her Sentinel Cycle. So the Sentinel Cycle is my trilogy of science fiction books that are set about 50 years in the future. And this is a future in which there are very few nation states left. Most of the world participates in what's called microdemocracy, which are these small units of jurisdiction that can vote for any government anywhere in the world. And it's all held together by this large global bureaucracy, sort of a cross between the UN and Google, dedicated to information management. The name of the bureaucracy is Information. That's Information with a capital I. It gathers data from citizens who are enmeshed in a sophisticated technology network that is set sometime in the 2060s, but feels a little more like the near future. There's a kind of tech they have that overlays a lot of the information into their vision. You know, it's an augmented reality, so they'll look at something and there'll be a kind of commentary uh, written beside it. So they are very linked into tech. But if I, 15 years ago, were to look at the way that people today interact with their smartphones, I would see that as extremely linked into tech in a very similar sort of way. Malka Older brings to her writing an impressive combination of expertise. She has been around the world as a humanitarian worker and a disaster relief provider, experiences that inform her writing. She explains why Information, the omnipresent company featured in her books, is not the Big Brother surveillance that it seems. And so this is an organization that takes in all of the data that's available from everywhere. So surveillance cameras in cities, but also things like search engine data, what people have been looking for, anything that's public in any way. But they not only take it in, they also try to make sure that it's available to everybody. So it's less kind of the surveillance state that we're thinking about in 1984 and more a giant internet. I see. Well, give me some examples of the kind of information it gathers. I mean, it isn't just, you know, the news of the world kind of stuff. No, this is really everything that anyone is doing anywhere in the world. And, of course, the flip side of that is that there's so much information available that it's quite easy to hide things. So my books are thrillers, and there are spies, and there are chase scenes, and there's quite a lot of how you hide information when everything is available to everybody. But this includes where people are traveling to, where they're walking to on the street, arguments that people might have on the street, what people are searching on the internet. So there's a lot of stuff that's just there available if people do want to look. But there is an enormous bureaucracy, kind of like the UN now, but bigger. (laughs) As I said, the UN plus all the people who work for Google and maybe all the people who work for Facebook and Yahoo and Amazon too, who are there to go through the information, collate it, translate it, compile it, see what needs to be adjusted for understandability to provide Uh, data visualizations to present it in other ways that are more understandable for different people with different levels of education. So there's a very large human effort that's going into this. Let's get back to this uh, information gathering, the surveillance system uh, information. Does the surveillance system rely, I I mean, you know, just a technical point, but does it rely on high-tech sensors? Uh, uh, You know, are they all over the place? Does it uh, use artificial intelligence to recognize the people in the pictures, or, you know, how sophisticated is it? The technology in my books is a little bit advanced from where we are now. I had to have some fun playing with the toys. But for the most part, the system that I described doesn't actually require many more advances in technology than where we are now. And it's meant to be very much a commentary on where we are. And I think the level of surveillance that I describe in it is also not that far advanced from the level of surveillance that's going on now. It's the way that it's handled, the way that information is managed, Uh, who it belongs to, and what is done with it that's different. So it's the information processing that's uh, qualitatively different here, not the gathering. The processing, the ownership, and the management, what's done with it. The book is about the fact that whoever controls information controls power in the society. And so a lot of the series, the trilogy, is about these people who work for this organization struggling to keep it functioning as intended, to keep it as an authority on information that provides data to people as a service, 
without letting it get hijacked and without letting it get discredited, because either of those will make it useless, essentially. You know, Marco, you could have written a nonfiction book about all this and, you know, said, uh, but you didn't. You decided to address these ideas through science fiction. Why'd you do that? Well, I love stories, and I think that there are a lot of people like me who assimilate information in a very different way when they're reading it as a narrative that they can identify with the characters than when they're reading a piece of nonfiction about their world. So that's one. And two, also, you know, I do think sometimes it's easier to understand truths about your world when you have a little bit of distance from it, when it's kind of metaphorical. And so you can think about how would it feel for me to live in this world where there's total surveillance and everyone knows about it. And hopefully some of the people will sort of come back around through that and think, well, a lot of the surveillance described in the book is not that different from what's happening now. I just know less about it. Uh, I'm a little curious because your background includes working as, well, a humanitarian aide in, in, in that field and also as an expert in disaster response. I'm trying to connect the two, you know, disaster response and this fictional future where information is so readily available. Where, where did that come about? In fact, part of the inspiration for this organization, Information in My Book, came from a disaster response that I worked on. It was an earthquake response in West Sumatra in 2009, and the UN, which does a lot of the coordination in a disaster response, had brought in a person who was dedicated, their entire job was to do information management. So we were all running around, you know, trying to figure out what was needed where and, and source blankets and jerry cans and deliver them. And there was a person who whose job was to sit in the office and take all the information that people from different NGOs and different organizations and the government were bringing in, put it into maps, uh, put it into tables, put it into other ways that it could be quickly understood and so that we could figure out where was the best place for us to put our efforts. And have... that really got me thinking about information as a public good, as something that could be like electricity or like transportation that everybody needs to use that's incredibly important for our functioning in society. And yet right now is controlled in very different ways. So how is the surveillance in your book handled differently than it would be, say, in society today? Today, most of that information that I talk about is already being collected, but it's being collected by companies and governments that then kind of segregate that information away from us. They keep it. They either keep it for use of some kind or they sell it and make money off of it. We don't know what that data is. We don't know exactly what they're doing with it. Um, they have ownership of the data based on our actions. In the book, I look at a society in which data is a public good. Information is a public good. And so this organization is basically a public utility that is there to make information available for everybody. If someone is collecting it, it should be public. Now this is, sounds like sort of opening up the vaults at Facebook or something like that. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're living in, uh, people have written about what is called surveillance capitalism, right? Our data is worth money. And it's being used largely without our consent or with this kind of coerced consent and certainly in ways that we don't know about and aren't privy to. And one of the ways to make that data suddenly not have the same value for these companies is to make it all free. Well, I read that your mother emigrated to the United States from Cuba in the 1960s. Uh, does that country's history of uh, censorship, monitoring civilians and so forth, has that influenced your decision to take on these themes? It really does. And part of the way that it influences it is the fact that they were able to do it with very little technology. So I do want to make the point that it doesn't take technology to surveil people or to intrude on people's privacy. It just takes a kind of social technology about what you can get people to care about and be afraid of. But on the other hand, I've also, in my work as a humanitarian and in international development, I've worked in a lot of different countries that do have different levels of surveillance and propaganda and different ways that they use information for control. So I've worked in places like Sudan and Darfur. I've worked in places like Indonesia, which had shortly before made the transition out of a very repressive state into a democracy. Um, I've traveled to places like Myanmar. And really seeing that these are really fundamental questions in governments all over the world, including our own. Surely you've come across the kind of negative reaction that you're likely to get here in the United States to these sorts of things, because people are going to uh, recall, you know, the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany and so forth. 
you know, is, is surveillance meant you were being surveilled not just by machines hanging on the wall, right, or sensors. You were being surveilled by everybody who lived around you, and, and if you did something that somebody thought was suspicious, that information would be made at least available to the government. Sure. And my book is often described as a dystopia, which I always find a little bit strange because I, I think it's a very hopeful book, uh, not just in the system it describes, but in the way that all the characters in the book are trying to make the world a better place and believe that they can, even if they disagree on what a better place means. But again, all those examples that you give of surveillance are examples where the surveillance is taken and hidden. Most of the power that that has is in not knowing what the government has on you. That is how surveillance works in places like Cuba and it worked in places like the Soviet Union and so on, where the potential information that could be held over people's head to recruit them into informing on other people and create these chains and these suspicions and these neighborhood watches. And it has to do with the government having sole control over data and information. I think that when we talk about the question of humanity and technology, we're often kind of missing the point because I think where we tend to go wrong is that we think of technology as having less humanity in it than it does. Because in fact, all of the technology we use is very much impacted by the humans who built it and designed it, the human needs that created it. And you know that's how we end up thinking of algorithms as neutral as opposed to as inhabiting the same biases as the people who wrote the algorithms. That's how we end up thinking of the progress of technology as something that's kind of exogenous and will happen no matter what, as opposed to something that we make choices about. You know, there's a kind of a knee-jerk reaction, I think, amongst many in the public. I'm generalizing here, of course. But that, that much new technology, particularly when it comes to gathering information, whether it's social media or, or cameras along the roadside, that that's, that's a threat. That's something that has to be looked at as potentially you know, corralling uh, human behavior, that, that, that it's an imposition on our lives. And you take a much more hopeful point of view here. Technology is not the enemy, that it's the way the information is made available or curated or whatever, except that, of course, the obvious rejoinder is, well, who controls that? But, you know, you're, you're not a Luddite here. No, and I think it's really important to remember that these attitudes, we had the same attitudes towards books when they first came out. They were considered very dangerous. And in fact, books, when they first came out, were very much an elite technology that not everyone could afford to produce them. And similarly, we have seen over the past century that radio can be used in extremely dangerous ways in the right circumstances. And yet we can also see how powerful a force for good radio can be. So we can see that all these technologies, as they have come out, they occasioned the same kind of fear and concern about what they would do to society. And in some cases, they've lived up to that. And in some cases, they've also had very positive effects in terms of what we can do as a society, in terms of the connections we can forge, in terms of the kind of government that we can demand. And so what we need to be looking at is not just, you know, is the internet a terrible thing, but who is controlling the internet? How are they controlling it? Who is regulating that? What are the kinds of benefits that we should be looking for? And how can we promote those? Malka Older, thanks so very much for uh, putting out all this information to uh, all the sentinels in the world. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Malka Older is a humanitarian aid worker and the author of the books in the Sentinel Cycle, Infomocracy, Null States, and most recently, State Tectonics. So the big picture here, as I see it, is set against a kind of a very special background, and that is the profound changes being wrought in the 21st century. You know, the 19th century, we developed mechanical devices that uh, spared our muscles. They, they, they could do things our muscles couldn't. But in this century, we're building machinery that can do things that our brains can't. Artificial intelligence, something that could be smarter than we are, I mean, that's clearly both a threat and perhaps a promise. I have to say, I, I got some optimism from Malka Older's view on this. It, there, this threat to our humanity from, for example, social media, as Douglas Rushkoff was talking about, I mean, I find that actually kind of ironic because if you believe the evolutionary biologists, what made Homo sapiens in the first place, as smart as we are, was the fact that we're social critters. It was that social interaction. And what we've heard, though, is it depends on how it's used. It depends on who is wielding the technology and what their motivations are. Do you feel like technology rules your life? 
Uh, technology doesn't rule my life, except in the sense that I've always been very interested in technology. Even as a kid, I was building electronic stuff. Do you carry your smartphone with you, and is the ringer on? Uh, no and no. <laughs> you have one, though, right? I do. I think it lives in my car. It enjoys it in there. Okay, so it does not own you. My my smartphone? Yeah. Uh, you know, when I look at the bill, I sometimes think maybe, but no, it does not. Thanks to the members of our team who are still human, as far as we can tell. Senior producer Gary Niederhoff, assistant producer Sarah Derwin, and operations manager Barbara Vance. I'm executive producer Molly Bentley. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bowes Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer, Seth Shostak, and a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called Keeping Humans in the Loop. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, you'll find past episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you never want to miss an episode, subscribe to BiPiSci on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or Pandora. Or sign up on our new platform, Himalaya. I will release you from surveillance. We will work together unwillingly at first on your part, but that will pass.